Okay, in this video, we're going to cover um, section 10.1, which is um, the introduction of matrices and um, systems of equations. So I just kind of wanted to give you a hindsight of the rest of chapter 10, which is the last pieces of material that we will cover in this course. So 10.1 is really meant to be like an intro to matrices. Um, and we're going to also solve um, systems using matrices. Um, and then the method that we're going to use is called Gauss Jardin method or just um, Jardin method. So I'll talk about uh, the difference between the Gauss Gaussian elimination and then the Gauss Jardin elimination. Okay. Um, they're essentially the same thing, except one of them you get to stop prematurely, and the other one you have to complete it all the way through. So 10.2 is going to be a, more about matrices, but it's going to be specifically about arithmetic of matrices. So how do you add, subtract, multiply matrices? We don't really divide matrices. Um, we do something else called an inverse, and that's what 10.3 will be about. Then 10.4, and then we'll also use inverses to solve more systems of equations. So there's really three different methods to solving systems using matrices. One of them is the Gauss Gaussian uh, elimination method or Gauss Jardin elimination method. Um, and then there's another one using inverses. And then we'll talk about determinants. We'll define what that is and everything. Um, and then finally, we'll get to section five, which is Kramer's rule. And Kramer's rule will allow us to talk about um, another method on how to solve matrices. Now, of all of these three, this one's gonna be the easiest, but we can't use it until we learn what we need to know about matrices and we talk about inverses and determinants, okay? Once we have introduced all of that information, it kind of all leads up to this Kramer's rule, which is really um, a savior in, in, in the computation of solving systems of equations, okay? Especially when some of our systems could get more lengthy, like not just two equations and two variables, but maybe three equations and three variables, even 10 equations and 10 variables. Uh, Kramer's rule just makes it a little bit easier, okay? Um, well, with the 10 by 10, it's always difficult, but anyway. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So the first thing we have is um, we're gonna have a streamlined technique for solving systems other than equations. This technique is gonna use the rectangular array of real numbers called a matrix. So there's your definition. A matrix is a rectangular array of numbers, okay? What does that mean? It just means that we're gonna have a bunch of numbers and they're gonna be in a position um, to where it looks like a rectangle, okay? And normally to tell us that that is one matrix, they usually use these symbols to let us know that that is one matrix, okay? If you have multiple matrix, I can't say it because the right word is right there, but if you have multiple of them, then those are called matrices. Okay, so matrices are plural, matrix is singular. Now, here's the definition of what a matrix looks like. So you just have this symbol here to signify where your matrix begins and where it ends, okay? And then each one of these numbers that are in this matrix are all called an entry, okay? So this guy is an entry, that guy is an entry, this guy is an entry, everybody in the matrix is an entry, okay? And then if you wanna talk about how large or how big the um, matrix is, that is called your dimensions, okay? So your dimensions are always gonna be the number of rows by the number of columns. So notice that here it says it's called an M by N matrix, okay? And why is that? It's because it has 
of the M number of rows, right? There's M number of rows, and then it has N number of columns, okay? So M number of rows, N number of columns, and it's called an M by N, okay? Now, each entry in the um, matrix can be denoted by, um, they usually use A just to signify the matrix, okay? And then the first number, which they're calling I here, is going to tell you the row number. And then you have J, which is going to tell you the column. So if I'm talking about something that says two, three, this means the entry in row two and column three. So I would go down to row two and then over, that's one, two, three, and it would be this um, entry that I'm referring to, okay? Now matrices, if you're talking about the matrix itself, you use a capital letter like A, or B. And if you're talking about his entries, you would be talking about little a11, little a12, little a21, little a22, so on and so forth. I don't know how big these matrices are, okay? The same thing with B. If you're talking about a matrix B, then his entries would be labeled his, her, I, I don't know why I use pronouns, but anyway, um, this matrix, matrix, I can't say it. But this matrix would have entries in the form of B11, B12, B21, B22, and so forth, okay? Again, I don't know if there's more columns. I don't even know if there's more rows, okay? It just depends on the dimensions of matrix A and the dimensions of matrix B. So here's just a summary of what I was saying. So it says the ith row and the jth column is uh, denoted by a double subscript where it says ij. For instance, a23 refers to this, the entry in the second row, the third column, okay? Um, a matrix that only has one row looks like this. It's just one row and then you have all your entries. Now I don't know how many columns it has, but it would look something like that. And then a column matrix is when you only have one column, but I don't know how many rows you have. So it would look like that, okay? And then a matrix having M number of rows and N number of columns is said to be of order M by N. Now I just wanna point out that order is the same thing as dimensions. And I want to mention that because sometimes the problems will ask you what is the order of the matrix, and then some problems will ask you what are the dimensions of the matrix, and they are the same thing, okay? You're just telling them how many rows and how many columns there are, and the order matters, okay? So a two by three is not the same as a three by two, okay? So a two by three would be two rows and then three columns, and so it would look like that. Whereas a three by two has got three rows and only two columns. And it looks like this. So different kind of rectangle, right? Um, so the dimensions do matter. And you have to put the row, the number of rows first and then the number of columns. It says if M equals N, meaning that the same number of rows as it has columns is called a square matrix. And so then those numbers would be the same. And it doesn't matter whether you use the M's or the N's because they're the same, okay? Um, and then the main entries in the diagonal are A11, A22, A33. I think there's, um, and it's just looking at this, right? If you look at the diagonal of that, mm -hmm, all the diagonal entries have those uh, repeated in uh, subscripts. Okay, so here it says, determine the order of each matrix. So for here, it's only gonna be a one by one. I have one row and one column. So it's a one by one. Whereas B, I only have one row, but I have one, two, three, four columns. 
here I have two rows, but I don't, but I have two columns. Here I have one, two, three rows, and then I have two columns. So that is the dimensions or the order of each matrix. And this is just saying the same thing. And then down here, it's the same thing. So a matrix is derived from a system of linear equations where each, uh, is, each equation is written in standard form with the constant term on the right side of the equation. So notice that all of these are in standard form. You have your x is first, your y is next, your z is next, and then your constants on the right side of the equation. They must be in this form before you can create your augmented matrix, okay? An augmented matrix it can also be, um, well, no. An augmented matrix is when you have, here, let me give you an example down here, is when you have all the coefficients on one side, and then you have like this bar here, and then you have the constants. Now, this top row comes from equation one, the second row comes from equation two, the third row comes from equation three. The first column comes from the coefficients of x, the second column comes from the coefficients of y, and the third column comes from the coefficients of z. And then, of course, we know that the last one is our constants, okay? That is how you know which number to put where, okay? Now, if you were to not worry about the constants and just worry about the coefficients, that has a name and it's called the coefficient matrix. And we will use that later once we get um, into like 10.3, okay. So it says, note that the use of zero for the missing coefficient of the variable y in the third equation. And also note that the fourth column of constant terms in the augmented matrix. So they're saying that this fourth term is all your constants. And notice that here they were missing a y var variable. And so they put in a zero for that missing term. But notice it's all the coefficients, positive one, negative four, positive three, right? Negative one, positive three, negative one. And then positive two, no y, so a zero, and then negative four. And then your constants are just still the same. Okay. Um, it says when forming either the coefficient matrix or the augmented matrix of a system, you should begin by vertically aligning the variables in the equations and using zeros for the coefficients of missing variables. So remember, I told you when you get it in its standard form, it will always be some coefficient x plus some coefficient y plus some coefficient, it's probably a bad letter to use, um, times z equal to your constant, okay? All of your equations need to look like this before you write the augmented matrix. Now, with matrices, you can do some things, okay? And these should look very, very, very familiar because when we talked about the allowable operations that you could do to solve a system of equation, these were the exact same three, um, statements, okay? So you can interchange any two equations, right? Just like you can interchange any two rows, okay? So it, you know that the top row is equation one, the second one is equation two, and the third um, row is equation three. I could rewrite it so that equation three is on top. I'll leave equation two alone and then basically swap these two. And these matrices will have the same corresponding solutions, okay? This one is also important. It says you can multiply an equation or a row by a non-zero constant, okay? You will usually do this to obtain a one. And more specifically, you would multiply by the reciprocal of where you're trying to obtain a one. That might not make sense right now, but I will explain it later, okay? 
Once we start getting into our row operations, you will know when you need to make something a one or when you need to make something a zero, okay? You can add a multiple of a row to another row. This step you will use when you're trying to obtain zeros in your entries, okay? Now, this is the notation that we're going to use because just to give you some hindsight, we're going to be writing things into a matrix and then we're going to be doing a bunch of operations on this matrix to solve the matrix, okay? And you're gonna need to know how to write it, okay? So if you want to interchange them, mean swap rows, you're gonna use this notation. So for example, I want to, I switched row one and row three. I can say row one is going to swap out with row three, okay? If I want to multiply a row by something, let's say I want to take um, one half. So I'm going to do one half row one, okay? I usually do a um, one, uh, one way arrow and say that that's going to give me my new row one, okay? Now here is pretty important too. It says you can take a constant multiplier of one row and add it to another row. So if I were to say, let's say I took negative three times row two and I wanna add row three, you need to know which new row is gonna happen. That result, will it replace row two or will that result replace row three? You need to know. Okay, and it's always the one that does not get a coefficient. So the one you're adding, just like the way it was, you're not multiplying the entries by a number, you're just adding the exact same entries, that is the one that you're going to replace. Okay, again, a lot of this is not going to make any sense until you start seeing the problems work F. Okay, I'm trying to explain the notation as best as I can without you seeing it. It is going to be super important that you know how to write this notation to tell you what you're doing, okay? And the reason why you're going to need to do this is because these problems are going to be a little lengthy. Some of them can be. And most times, especially while you're learning, you're going to get them wrong a lot at the beginning. Um, the reason why is because you have this big array of numbers, and then you're going to do something to it, and then you have to recopy that big array of numbers. And every time you have to recopy something, we are human. And statistically, we're going to copy something incorrectly. Um, and I can't even tell you how many times that has happened to me personally, okay? So one, you always have to make like double, triple, quadruple sure that you wrote down everything correctly. And every single step you make, you're gonna have to make sure that you wrote down everything correctly. Because if you have one number that's off, it's gonna throw everything else after that off. OK, and you will be wasting a lot of paper if you just keep starting over and over and over and over and over again. You need to be able to backtrack where you started, follow all your steps and find your errors and then just change them and then change them throughout the rest of the problem. OK, I mean, yes, sometimes you are going to get frustrated and you should just start off fresh. But at least once try to go back and find where your mistake is. And if you can't find it then just stop. Or if you find it, you correct it and it's still marking it wrong, then yeah, just go ahead and start off fresh, okay? But these notations are definitely going to help us in figuring out what it was that you did. And then you can kind of follow your steps to try to figure out uh, where it went wrong, okay? So we're definitely gonna be using this notation a lot today. Now, Here's just an example. You start off with an original matrix and it's telling you to interchange the first and second rows. So these two rows are gonna swap. So we're gonna do row one swap with row two. And so what that means is that this top row is now gonna go in the middle and that middle row is now gonna go at the top, okay? And so this is the new matrix, but it is row equivalent to the past one, okay? So now here's another example. It says, multiply the first row of the original matrix by two. So what does that mean? 
that means one half times row, the first row, which means row one. Okay, so I'm going to take every single one of these and I'm going to multiply them by half. It's the same thing as doing row one divided by two. So I'm going to take two and divide it by two. I'm going to take negative four and divide it by two, six and divide it by two, and negative two divided by two. And these are all what you get. And this is also a row equivalent matrix. Here's another example. This one's a little bit more complicated. And this one I do not recommend you try to do in your head. OK? They just tell you this is the answer. But I'm going to show you where all these numbers came from. OK? So it says add negative two times the first row um, to the third row. So remember, this is the one that's not getting multiplied by anything. So that's gonna be my new row three, okay? Now, negative two times row one means I'm gonna multiply all of its entries by negative two. So I get negative two, negative four, eight, and negative six. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add row three's entries. So two, one, five, and negative two. And when I do that, negative two plus two is zero. Negative four plus one is negative three. Eight plus five is 13. And negative six plus negative two is negative eight. And all of this is going to be my new row three. And so notice that the row three's entries are the exact same that I found over here on the side. OK, um, again, that notation is going to be super important. OK, so let's go ahead and talk about this Gaussian elimination, because that is our method that we need to use to solve the systems. OK, so this is the Gauss-Jardin elimination, and I'm going to talk about the stuff, and then I think we have an example um, coming up, okay? Um, so with the Gauss, Gaussian elimination, now I will do it as long as they tell me to do it this way, but this is definitely not the one that I usually use, okay? I usually use the Gaussian Jardin elimination, okay? Um, only because that one is fully worked out and I don't have to worry about some of the extra steps that you have with this Gaussian elimination. And if I'm already going to be messing around with the matrix, I'd rather just mess around with the matrix until I'm done than to like halfway do it. And then ugh, it's just weird. <laughs> so again, you'll see when I, when I work one out. So it says um, the term echelon refers to the uh, stair step pattern performed by uh, non-zero entries of the matrix. Okay. And what they're talking about is they haven't mentioned it yet but you have something called the identity matrix and they're not gonna mention this until later. So I definitely wanted to talk about it now because otherwise you don't understand what they're talking about, non-zero entries and stair step pattern. What stair step pattern? We haven't seen any pattern like that, right? So with the identity matrix, essentially what it is, is that the diagonals, and again, I don't know how far this is going, but all the diagonals will have one and then all of the other entries will be zeros. And so it goes on in that pattern, okay? Um, so then for our first step of this row, um, echelon, row reduced, all that gosh Jordan or gosh elimination, it says any rows consisting entirely of zeros will, should be should occur at the bottom of the matrix. So if you do see a row that has all zeros and no, no numbers in it, you definitely want to kick that one to the bottom of the matrix and keep solving the rest of it as much as you can. Okay. For each row that um, that should be does. For each row that does not consist of entirely of zeros. The first non-zero entry is one, called the leading one, and that is this guy here, okay? For two successive non-zero rows, the leading one in the higher row is further to the left than the leading one in the lower row. So again, it's just trying to explain in words that the ones are occurring in the diagonals. 
And then it says a matrix in row echelon form is in reduced row echelon form when every column has a leading one in every position, okay? So essentially what it means is that if you could get your matrix like this, It doesn't matter what the numbers are. I'm trying to make sure I have, it doesn't matter what these numbers are over here. Um, it's considered row reduced when you have these ones in the diagonals and everybody underneath has zeros, okay? That is considered row, uh, reduced row echelon form, okay? Now, just if I'm gonna talk about it, okay? So Gauss elimination, is to get it in this form, okay? So you wanna get it to where you have all the ones in the diagonal and then the zeros here and nobody cares what's up there, okay? And then what you do is you will, okay, so step one will be to take your system and put it into an augmented matrix. Then you will manipulate that augmented matrix using your row operations. And if you get it to look like this, you have performed Gaussian elimination, okay? Once you do that, you're gonna turn it back into a system and solve it using substitution, okay? Um, and I think they call it back substitution in the book, okay? That's great. The difference between Gaussian elimination and Gauss-Jordan elimination is that the Gauss-Jordan elimination goes one step further and not only does it get the zeros here, but it also gets the zeros here. And then whatever numbers are over there, we really don't care because those are our, actually our solutions. X would equal this number, Y would equal that number, Z would equal this number, and then if I have a W or whatever other variable, it would be that number, okay? Um, so it's just to let you know, this one would be the Gauss-Jordan elimination. Okay, so that's the difference and that's what I'm talking about. I don't wanna go from an algebraic system to matrix and then go back to algebra it just doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather go from an algebraic system to a matrix, completely manipulate it using matrices and then go back and just tell you that the answer is whatever these numbers are, okay? Um, so that's just my personal preference, but of course they're gonna want you to give an example of doing it by that, okay? So it says the Gauss elimination with back substitution works well for solving systems with linear equations by hand or with a computer. For this algorithm, the order in which the elementary rows are performed is important and that I can't even stress that enough, okay? You should operate from left to right by columns, okay? Using the elementary row operations to obtain zeros and all entries directly below the leading ones, okay? So this is what it's saying. Remember I showed you that identity matrix. You wanna turn this guy into a one first, okay? Then what you wanna do is you wanna use that one to turn all of these to zeros, okay? Then you will move on to the second guy and you will turn this one into a one. And then you will get all of these other remaining zeros fourth. Then you will get this guy into a one and all of the remaining zeros, six, okay? And so on and so forth. So, well, if you're doing Gauss Jordan, then yes, you would do the top ones too. But if you're doing just Gauss elimination, Gaussian elimination, you're only gonna do the bottoms to zeros, okay? But later when we get to Gosh Jardin, they'll also make what's on top zeros, okay? Now, here's a quick recap, okay? You're gonna multiply by a reciprocal to get ones. You're going to multiply 
the row with the leading one. by the opposite of the entry you are trying to make into zero. Because remember, the whole goal is to get a bunch of ones and to get a bunch of zeros, okay? And the only way you can get zero is if you have a number and then you add its opposite, okay? So to do that, you're gonna multiply the row with the leading one by the opposite of that entry value. So let's say I'm trying to turn a five into a zero. Then I would take the row, the row that has a one in the same column as that five, and I would multiply that one by a negative five. And then I would add it to the row that had the positive five. And what should happen is in that one entry, negative five plus five should turn it into a zero, okay? Again, it's going to take some process for us to see, so let's go through it. So here we have this one. The first thing we need to do is write that into an augmented matrix, okay? So as an augmented matrix, um, you want your Xs in one column, your Ys in another column, your Zs in a third column, your Ws, and then your constants. And these equal signs turn into a big bar in the matrix. So I don't have any Xs. My coefficient here is one, one, and negative two. I'm gonna draw my bar and negative three. I notice that the book doesn't draw the bar, but it does like this for row one, this for row two, this for row three, so on and so forth, okay? Um, it doesn't matter. I like to use the bar just because that's easier to write than all these little dots, okay? Um, but if you see the little dots in the book or if you see the little dots in the web assign, it's the same thing as this bar. It's just, they're kind of cutting you off and saying that was an equal sign and then the constant. So second row, coefficient is one, coefficient is two, negative one, and I'm missing a W, but the constant over here is two. Then two, four, one, negative three, negative two. One, negative four, negative seven, negative one, negative 19. This is called the augmented matrix. So we've taken the matrix and we've turned it in, or we've taken the system and we've turned it into a matrix. Um, so what we're gonna do is we have to obtain a one in this spot. And just FYI, you can never turn a number into a one because in order to get a number, you gotta multiply by the reciprocal to get a one. And there's no reciprocal of zero. If I put flip it over, the zero would be downstairs and that's undefined, okay? But what I can do to get the one is I can swap some rows. So maybe I wanna swap row one and row two. So I'm gonna do row one and row two swap. And my new matrix will become, so row two is one, two, negative one, zero, my bar, and then two. And row one was zero, one, one, negative two, and negative three. And then row three and row four are gonna stay exactly the same. So two, four, one, negative three, negative two, one, negative four, negative seven, negative one, negative 19. And so this is our new matrix, okay? Now what I wanna do is I wanna obtain zeros in all of the entries below that one, okay? Now, 
this one already is good to go. So I don't need to do anything with that one, but I do need to turn this into a one. And when I'm doing the rest of the column, I like to do both steps and then just rewrite the matrix once, okay? Instead of having to rewrite the matrix after every single step. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna need a negative two to add to this to turn it to a zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that leading one. So I'm gonna say negative two times the row one, because that's where the leading one is, plus this row, which is row three, and then that should create a zero in row three. So I wanna have a new row three. The same thing can be done to here. If I want this to turn to a zero, I need to add a negative one. So I'm gonna take my leading one and I'm gonna do negative one times row one plus this entry row, which is row four. And I wanna replace that with the zero. So I should be getting my new row four. And then here's all my side work that I like to write. So I'm gonna multiply all of these entries in row one by negative two. So I get negative two, negative four, positive two, zero, and negative four. Always double check your work because again, any wrong thing will make the whole thing go crazy. Then I'm gonna add row three. So two, four, one, negative three, negative two. I end up with zero, zero, three, negative three, negative six. Over here, I'm gonna do negative one times all the row one entries. So negative one, negative two, positive one, zero, and negative two. So negative one times every single entry. Then I'm gonna add row four underneath. So one, negative four, negative seven, negative one, negative 19. Here I get zero, negative six, negative six, negative one, and negative 21. And so remember, this is my new row three, this is my new row four. So I'm gonna rewrite the matrix and rows one and two are not changing. Those are staying the same. It's only row three and row four that are new. So row three is now zero, zero, three, negative three, negative six. And row four is zero, negative six, negative six, negative one, negative 21, okay? So then now I'm completely done with that first column. Now I'm gonna move on to the second column. So in the second column, we do already have the leading one exactly where it needs to be. We also have a zero underneath it, but I also need this entry negative six to be a zero. So how do I do that? I'm gonna use a positive six, the opposite of this number is positive six, times row, the row with the leading one. I'm working with this column. So the row with the leading one in that column is row two. So it's gonna be six times row two, plus this guy, which I'm trying to replace, which is row four. And that should give me a new row four. Now I do not have to manipulate the two because I am doing Gaussian elimination. If I were doing Gosh Jordan elimination, I would also be doing something to get that two to a zero as well. But for this purpose, I'm not going to do that. So then let's see, I'm gonna do row two times six. So that would stay zero, six, six, negative 12 and negative 18. And then I'm gonna place these entries underneath. And so then I get zero, 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 negative 13 and negative 39. And so then I am done with any, everything that I'm gonna do for this matrix. So I can rewrite it. And the only one changing is row four. You have to be very careful when you're rewriting these things not to make a mistake in copying down. Don't write the wrong number, don't write the wrong sign. Be very, very careful, okay? Oh, I was supposed to replace row four and I forgot. So this would be zero, 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 negative 13 and negative 39. So 
The second column is done as far as Gaussian elimination is concerned. If I were doing Gauss Jardin, I would also have to turn this two to a zero. But since I'm just using Gaussian, it's only the leading one and then all the zeros underneath. So I would move on to the next column. Now at this point, you can't switch rows because if you switch rows, the zeros and the ones won't be in the correct spots, okay? So no more switching rows. I know you see the one there, but if I put it down here, it will no longer have a zero in this spot. It would have this one in that spot, okay? So now I need to change this three into a one. And remember what I told you, use the reciprocal of that number and multiply it by that row. This happens to be row three. That will give me my new row three and hopefully it will be a one. So all the other row entries will stay exactly the same. Only row three is changing. So zero times one third is zero, three times one third is one, and six times one third is two. And so I get these values with these signs. Now that I have that one, I wanna make anything below it a zero, but it's already a zero, so it's good to go. The next step is to make this guy a one, right? That would complete the diagonal. So in order for me to make that guy a one, I have to do one over negative 13 times its row, which is row four. That would give me a new row four. So again, I'm rewriting it. Everybody is staying the same. The only row that's changing is row four. Now, negative 13 times one over negative 13 is positive one. Negative 39 times one over negative 13 is positive three. And if you're not sure, I'll do the last one. Okay, I'm gonna do negative, negative one over 13 times negative 39. And it does give you positive three. Okay. Um, so then now we're going to do what's called back substitution. And so now we're going to take this and we're going to turn it back into a system. So the system is going to be 1x plus 2y minus z, no w's, equal to 2. No x's, um, 1y, positive 1z, minus 2w, equals negative three, um, no x's, no y's, one z minus one w equal to negative two, no x's, no y's, no z's, one w equal to three. And then what we do is we back up. So we're gonna plug this three into that next equation going upward. So this becomes this. And if I add three on both sides, I can solve for z. Then if I plug in w and z into the next one, I get y, this would be negative six, so y minus five equals negative three. Let me solve for y. I get that y equals two. Then I would plug both y and z in the top equation to solve for x. So four minus one is three, minus three on both sides, I get x equals negative one. Now, when you write your solution point, it does have to be in the correct order. So it has to be the x's first, the y's next, the z's next, and then the w's last, okay? And this is the solution point. But see, I had to go with what I had in the matrices, then go back to the matrix or from the matrix to the system and then start using my algebra to go back and plug in, okay? Whereas I could have just kept going with my, when instead of when I turned this guy into a zero, I could have also turned that one into a zero. 
I could have also used this one to turn these into zeros, and I could have used this one to turn these into zeros. And then you would have had the same answer, okay? But that would have been called Gauss-Jardin elimination, okay? So it says uh, the procedure for using Gauss-Jardin elimination with back substitution is summarized below. You augment the matrix first. You use a row operations to rewrite the row, the augmented matrix in row echelon form. Um, then you write the system of linear equations corresponding to that row echelon form and use back substitution to solve, find the solution, okay? When solving a system of linear equations, remember that it's possible for the system to have no solution. If the elimination process you obtain a roll of all zeros except for the last entry, then the system has uh, no solution or is inconsistent. So that means that you have this equal bar. If you have a bunch of zeros on this side, but you have a number on that side that's not, not, not zero, then remember, zero equal to a number is false. And we know that when we have false statement, it's no solution, okay? So for gauss jardin elimination, um, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to continue the reduction process until you have a reduced row echelon, which is basically like you have the identity matrix. And then you have your constants over here. So you'll have one. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then over here, you'll have a number, a number, and a number. And that'll tell you, you have one X, no Ys, no Zs equal to this number. No Xs, one Y, no Zs equal to that number. No Xs, no Ys, and one Z equal to this number. And so um, that will essentially give you your solution. So let's look at this one. It says you have this matrix. It wants you to use gauche jardin which means go all the way and make it look like an identity matrix. Um, the row echelon form of linear matrix can be used with gauche elimination, but we're just going to go for it. So first thing I'm going to do is make the augmented matrix. So we have 1, negative 2, 3, the bar, and 9. Then we have negative 1, 3, 0, and negative 4. 2, negative 5, 5, and 17 for the last um, row. So then our first goal would be to obtain a 1 here, but we've already got it, so that's good to go. And then the next step would be to turn these two into zeros, okay? So with those, I like, do like to do them at the same time. So I would need to add a, a positive 1. So then I'm going to leave row 1 exactly the way it is and then add row two, and that should give me the zero here. So I'm gonna replace this with row two, okay? Then over here, I'm gonna to need to add a negative two. So I'm gonna negative two times row one, because remember you have to use this one to turn these to zeros. So I'm doing negative two times row one, and then I'm gonna add that to row three. And that should give me my new row three. So let's do the computations now. Row one is gonna stay exactly as it is. And row two is gonna stay exactly as it is. And I'm gonna add them together. So I get zero, one, three, and five. Then over here, I'm gonna do row one times negative two. So this will become negative two, positive four, negative six, negative 18. Row three is going to go directly underneath it, just as is. And then when I combine them, I'm going to get zero, negative one, negative one, negative one. So my matrix will become one, negative two, three, nine. And then row two will be this. And row three will be this. OK. Oops, you can't see that. There we go. So this became my new row two, and this became my new row three. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the next column. I need the one in this spot first. Always get your one first, and then get the two zeros. OK? 
okay? So here I'm going to get my two zeros. I'm gonna need a positive two. So positive two times the row with the leading one plus the row I'm trying to make a zero. That will give me my new row one, so I can have a zero there. Then I'm also gonna do positive one times row two plus row three to get me my new row three and hopefully with a zero in this spot, right? So let's see, row two times two. So I have zero, two, six, and 10. Row one is one, negative two, three, and nine. So when I add these together, I'm gonna get one, zero, nine, and 19. And when I do this, row two times one is gonna be zero, one, three, five, and row three is zero, negative one, negative one, negative one. I get zero, zero, two, and four. So now I'm gonna write my new matrix with these replacements. So row one is, new row one is right here. So it's gonna become one, zero, nine, and 19. Row two, there's nothing new about row two, so it's gonna stay the same as it was. Row three is gonna become this. Okay, now I have my new matrix. Now for this new matrix, we wanna move on to the next column and make this guy a one. So I have to use the reciprocal of two, which is one half. So one half row three to give me my new row three. So the only row that's changing here is that, and I have to change that before I can make these zeros, okay? So row one is gonna stay the same and row two is gonna stay the same. But one half times zero is zero, same again. One half times two is one, and one half times four is two. Again, you can use your calculator for the computations if you really need to. And later we will when it gets to a bunch of fractions because you can have fractions in this stuff, okay? Um, and it just happens that you get fractions. So we definitely can have fractions. Now, um, now I'm gonna take this one and I'm gonna use it to turn these into zeros. So in order to turn nine into zero, I need to add a negative nine. And I need to multiply that by my row three so that this entry will turn into a negative nine. And then I can add it to row one and it hopefully it will make my new row one have a zero in that spot. Similarly, I need to make this a zero. So I'm gonna do negative three times this row so that there will be a negative three entry here. And then if I add that to the row two entry, it should give me zero in my new row three. I'm sorry, new row two. Remember, the one that's not getting multiplied by something is the one that gets replaced, okay? So let's go ahead and do that computation. So row three times negative nine, that would be zero, zero, negative nine, negative 18. Then row one directly underneath it. And that would give me one, zero, zero, one. Then over here, negative three times row three. So zero, zero, negative three, negative six, and then row two underneath it. So then here we get zero, one, zero, and negative one. And so then my new matrix becomes new row one, new row two, new row three, and then the last row is staying exactly the same. There is nothing becoming new for row three. So this is it. Now, what does this mean? This means that one X equals one. This line, this row means one Y equals negative one. And the last row means one Z equals two. So what is my solution point here? My solution point is gonna be one negative one two. Okay. 
So let's go ahead and go into our practice problems. Again, you're going to want to watch that probably multiple times, and you're definitely going to need to see some more examples. So we have these practice problems to help us with that, okay? So this first practice problem says determine dimensions. So remember, it's the rows by the columns. There are two rows and there are three columns. Now for number two, it just wants me to write this in an augmented matrix. It does not want me to solve it. So I'm just gonna put my X coefficients, my Y coefficients, my bar, and then my constants. Okay, so in this case, it would be six, negative one, positive nine, positive one, positive one, and positive six. And that's it. That's all they wanted in this particular problem. So we're done with that one. Here it says use matrices to solve the system of equations if possible. It says use Gaussian Jardin elimination. If not possible, enter impossible. If the system is dependent, express X and Y in terms of the parameter A. So let's take a look at this problem. First, I'm gonna put it in my augmented matrix. So negative two, six equals negative 16, one, two, and negative seven. Notice that there are never variables inside here, okay? Unless the problem put variables in there and ask you to solve for a certain variable, it's the only time you should see variables for this class in your, in your uh, matrix. Now, most of you, if not all of you that are in this class are um, engineering, science, uh, STEM fields majors, okay? If you are an engineer major, I highly suggest that you do not learn how to use the calculator. You can't even see it, it like, it blacks it out. <laughs> um, I don't even know why I have that turned on because I don't need it really. Um, I'm just in my office. Let me choose my background and let me just turn it off. There we go. Um, so that way you can see the calculator. So your calculator does um, do, it does do matrices. Now what it does, I don't know exactly because I don't really use it too much, but it definitely will solve these things. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it will, it will solve them. But if you're an engineering major, I highly suggest that you don't try to figure out how to do it because if you're an engineering major, they will throw variables in here, specifically the variable called lambda, okay? When they throw that variable in there, you cannot use the calculator to figure out the value of lambda or any of your other variables. So I highly recommend that you learn to do all of the elimination process uh, without um, a calculator. And especially later when we get into determinants, you definitely want to know how to find the determinant, even if there's variables in there, okay? Um, in engineering, you'll eventually get into something called eigenvalues, and they usually use lambda to represent those. Um, and so they throw them into the system, and it becomes pretty hard to solve by hand, so they use matrices to solve them. Um, but you have to learn how to do the mechanics of this elimination process if you want to be successful in those courses later. So I know there might be shortcuts that exist right now, but don't use them unless you fully, fully understand what you're doing, because otherwise you will be at a loss when, when it comes to the time when you're gonna need this stuff again, okay? At least I, they sh should have nothing more to do than just to jog back your memory. They shouldn't have to be reteaching this information again, okay? Um, so I'm, of course, I'm gonna go through all the process. Now, I mean, I could multiply all of this by the reciprocal of negative two, which would be one over negative two to get the one, but I could also switch these to get the one in this spot. And I think that's what I'm gonna do just because that's a little bit easier, okay? Um, if these were not all even, 
then I wouldn't even suggest that you multiply by the reciprocal of negative two, because then you would cause fractions if not all of those numbers are even. Okay. Um, so I'm going to swap. I'm going to do row one swap with row two. Okay. And then I'm going to rewrite my new matrix. So then now I need a zero here. So I'm going to need a positive two times the row one, because he has the leading one, plus the row two to get me my new row two. So remember, you have to multiply this guy by what you need to get zero. So I'm going to multiply that one by two. So this would be a positive two. And then if I add it to this two, I would get the zero. So I'm going to do two times row one plus the row two, and that should give me my new row two. Now, my goal is to only change this, but of course, consequently, it's going to change the rest of it. So two times row one would be two. Two times two is four. Two times negative seven is negative 14. Now, row two is going to go directly underneath that. And I'm going to get zero, 10, and negative 30. So that's going to be my new row two. Now, all of my first column is done. I'm going to move on to the second column. But I need the diagonal to be ones. So I need this guy to be a one. And if you notice my pattern, when I need something to turn into a one, I box it. And when I need something to turn into a zero, I circle it. OK? Um, so I need this to turn into a one. So I'm going to multiply the reciprocal times row two to give me my new row two. So row one is going to stay the same. And then zero times one tenth is zero. 10 times one tenth is one. Negative 30 times one tenth is negative three. Now, if you can do the multiplication of fractions in your head, fantastic. If not, use the calculator, OK? Now I need to turn this guy into a zero. So I'm going to need um, negative two times that row with the leading one plus this row that I'm trying to get the zero. And the one that's not being multiplied by anyone is going to be the new one. So it's going to be a new row one. So let's see. Um, zero times negative two, one times negative two, negative three times negative two. And then row one will go underneath. And I get one, zero, negative one. So the new matrix becomes one, zero, negative one. And then the bottom is going to stay the same. And then what do we have here? We have that x equals negative 1. And down here, we have that y equals negative 3. So the solution is negative 1 comma negative 3. And you can check your answers. You just plug them in here. So let's check. It should work in both equations. So negative two times our x value plus six times our y value should equal negative 16. Well, that's true. Now let's check um, equation two. So we have negative one for x plus two times negative three for y equal to negative seven. That's negative one minus six which is negative seven. So it does check out to both equations. So that's one thing that's nice about these matrices is that you can check your answers, right? And I highly suggest you do before you type them in the computer to get to let it reveal whether or not you got the problem correct. Otherwise you have to like redo a whole nother one, okay? So it says, use the matrix capabilities of a graphing utility to write the augmented matrix corresponding to the system of linear equations in row reduced echelon form, then solve the system. If there is no solution, enter no solution. If the system is dependent, express X, Y, and Z in terms of parameter A, okay? I will actually show you how to do this. So again, I, I don't do it for all of them because you will not learn the techniques that you need to be learning. But if you go in your calculator, you see where it says matrix in blue? You're going to hit second and matrix, OK? 
Then you're gonna go over to where it says edit and I'm gonna edit matrix A. So I'm just gonna hit enter and I'm gonna enter matrix A. And it looks like it has four equations. So I'm gonna have four, oh, you can't even do it in the calculator because it won't let you put four um, rows. It'll only go to three by three. So I can't do it in the calculator anyway. So just erase this and just say, write the augmented matrix, right? Capital W. How do they do in English? I think it's like three lines to tell you to capitalize it. But we're just gonna do these instructions, okay? So I'm gonna first write this in its matrix. So I have uh, three for X, three for Y, 12 for Z, and then equal to 12. Here I get one, one, four, and four, two, five, 20, 23, negative one, two, eight, and 11. Now let's see what's gonna happen here, okay? So I wanna get a one in this first spot. But I think I'm going to do that by just switching row one and row two. So the top one will become one, one, four, four. And then the bottom or the second one will become three, three, 12, 12. The other rows are going to stay exactly the same. Now I want to make all three of these zero. So I'm gonna write out the game plan first and then I'll execute it and then rewrite the matrix. So I need a negative three. So negative three times the row with the leading one plus the row with the positive three and that will replace the row with the positive three. Here I need a negative two times the row with the leading one to give me my new row three. Here I'm gonna need a positive one times row one plus row four, giving me my new row four. So in my new matrix, row two, three, and four are changing. Only row one is gonna stay the same. So let's see, row one times negative three. Negative three, negative three, negative 12, negative 12. Row two underneath. Here I get zero, 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 and zero. Now negative two times row one and row three underneath. So I get zero, three, 12, and 15. So that would be my new row three. Then one times row one plus row four. I get zero, three, 12, and 15. Now I'm supposed to get a one here. And now remember, you can't switch because then if I switch any of these rows anymore, it's gonna put this one in a different spot and that one needs to go here. So you cannot switch them. What I can do is I can switch, um, I'm actually just gonna kick, I'm gonna swap these two. So I'm gonna do row two, swap with row four, because I want that one to go to the bottom. Remember it said any row that had all zeros should be at the bottom, okay? So I'm gonna kick that one to the bottom by swapping row two and row four. So this becomes one, one, four, four, and then zero, three, 12, 15, 0, 3, 12, 15, and then 0, 0, 0, 0 at the bottom. Now the next goal is to move on to this next column and get a 1 here, since I couldn't do that with the 0 that was there. You can never turn a 0 into a 1, okay? Doesn't matter what you multiply by, and there's no reciprocal of 0, so you can't do it using our traditional steps, okay? So we're going to move on to changing that which means I need to do one third times row two. 
to get my new row two. So this is going to become one, one, four, four, um, zero times a third. Okay, so now we already have the zero underneath, but we definitely want to turn these into zeros. Okay, oh, yeah, no, nope, I'm good. Not that one. We need to turn everybody. So we got this second leading one. We need to turn these guys into zeros. So in order to do that, I need this, I need a negative one to cancel this to be a zero. So I need a negative one times row two plus row one to give me my new row one. I also need to make that a zero. So I'm gonna need to add a negative three times row two plus row three to get me my new row three. So let's work with the first one. Zero, negative one, negative four, negative five, and then row one underneath. Then negative three times row two. And I get a bunch of zeros. So now I have one, row one becomes this one, zero, zero, negative one. Row two is zero, one, four, five. Row three is now a bunch of zeros and row four was already a bunch of zeros, okay? You can't continue on because you can never turn a zero into a one. So I can't go any further. I'm trying, but I can't, okay? So what we have to do is we have to go back to our equations. So this is telling me X equals negative one. And then this is telling me that Y plus four Z equals five. If you can solve for one of the variables, please do. So if I solve for y, I'm just going to minus 4z over. So y equals negative 4z with a positive 5. Now, when you have 0 equals 0, that's not no solution. 0 equal to 0 is true. And we know that when we have true, we have infinitely many solutions. And when we have infinitely many uh, solutions, um, we have to express our x, y, and z's in terms of a parameter a. Why well, don't for x? Because I know what x is, right? x is one, negative one. But what I can do is I can say, let z equal a, then y would equal negative four a plus five. And we already know x is equal to negative one. So what do my solution points look like? They look like negative one for X, negative four A plus five for Y, and then just A for Z. And depending on what A is, I could give you all of the points that line up with those lines. Okay, now that was the end of um, this. So if you do happen to get a bunch of zeros down here and then you get another number that's not zero, remember zero cannot equal a non-zero number. So in that case, you wouldn't go through all this, you would have a false statement and you would just say there's no solution. It does happen every now and then, just not very often, okay? Um, but that is it for this section and I will continue with 10.2 in the next video.